Well, children, how many of you have had a baby before? You, you've had a baby. No, you have a baby brother and brother, but you don't have a baby, do you? No, none of you. You know, caring for babies is really easy, right? No? No, it's no, no, you're right. I've, we've had quite a lot of babies and they're really hard to look after. You know, the really weird thing is that when you get a baby, have one. you have one too. Oh, fantastic. When you get a baby, do you know what it doesn't come with? A manual. Wouldn't that be helpful? If when you got a baby, they gave you a manual and it just said, you know, um, when the baby cries, you need to feed it. And when it makes this sort of noise, it's because it needs a nappy change. Although you can normally figure that one out pretty easy, can't you? Yeah. So that would be really helpful. But do you know what would be even better? Is if babies had these like screens. You've got two babies. No, just one, mate. Just one, yeah. So if they had a TV screen, okay? And every time they needed something, it just popped up on the TV screen and told you what to do. That would be really handy, wouldn't it? But it's not that way, is it? Well, what about the Christian life? Is living a Christian life easy? No, it can be pretty hard, eh? And how do you how do you know what to do and, and what's right and what's wrong? How, how are we ever going to know? You know what would be really helpful? If someone gave us a manual of how to follow the Lord. Wouldn't that be helpful? That's right. What's our manual? That's right. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? I can just get you to do that. Um, that's right. We're given a manual, aren't we? See, unlike with a baby where it's a lot of trial and error, and as your parents will tell you, they made all the mistakes on the oldest child and slowly learnt after them. In the Christian faith, we're given a Bible. And it's very precious because it's God's word to us so that we might know Christ and be saved and so that we might live for him. And the Bible is completely sufficient, which is a really big word, which means it has everything we need. We don't need to look anywhere else because we have the Bible. And later on, Dr. Greg He's not a medical doctor. He's just a different type of doctor. It gets very confusing, I know. But Dr. Greg is going to be talking to us about the Word of God. And so you've got to listen really carefully and ask yourself, what do I need to believe about God's Word? We all need to ask that, don't we? What should we believe about God's Word? So let's pray and ask God to help us do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for your Word, which is rich and true. We thank you for our children. Thank you for the way that you continue to encourage us and encourage them. And we just pray that as a family, we would gather around them and show them the beauty of Christ and your word. Help us all, Lord, to lay hold of your word and to benefit from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1, and this is God's holy and infallible word for you tonight. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, 
He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Amen. And may God bless the word to us and let us come before him in a time of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word which you've given us. And Lord, as we come and, and sit under the preaching of your word, we do pray would you bless our hearts? At the end of the day, Lord, we acknowledge that we are simply hungry beggars, desperately looking for the bread of life. And so as, as one beggar points us to the bread of life, we pray that you would feed us. We pray that, Lord, as we gaze into your word, that at the end of the day, we would, by faith, see the Lord Jesus Christ. We would see him exalted and we would rejoice in him. And we would taste and see that the Lord is good. We thank you, Lord, that when your word is read and when your word is preached, you speak. And so we pray that you would speak through your servant this evening. That, Lord, we would all forget the name of Dr. Greg, but everyone would remember the name of Jesus Christ. Would you speak to us now, Father, by your Son, through your Spirit, in your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Greg. Well, it's, uh, it's good to be with you tonight. And uh, yep, uh, I don't get called Dr. Greg. <coughs> Dr. Greg, very often the students get in trouble if they use the word doctor. And uh, so just uh, Dr. Greg with the... Doctor chopped off, so I, it almost got me into trouble the other day because I was on Jetstar flying between Sydney and Melbourne and there was a medical emergency. <laughs> now, now, the only time I do use doctor is when I fly because I'm hoping for a slightly better seat, and that is the literal truth. So is that, was there a doctor on the plane? So, yep, I, I'm, pretty, I'm totally useless in a medical emergency. But hopefully not totally useless as we look at God's Word tonight. And uh, I'm wanting to take you to the book of Hebrews. It's a book that I've studied closely, which is great. And I'm sure your Logan, your minister, has studied it closely. Perhaps he's taken you step by step through this book of Hebrews. Uh, something I've noticed, and uh, I suspect it's something that you've noticed too, the writer to the Hebrews makes a great deal of use of the Old Testament scriptures. He quotes from the Old Testament. In fact, most of chapter 1 is uh, taken up. Or it's almost entirely taken up with a series of quotations from the Old Testament. He refers to Old Testament stories, the wilderness, Old Testament characters, Melchizedek, actually quite a few. So here's a part of the Bible that makes a great deal of use of the Bible. Well, what I want to do tonight, I've only got one night with you. I want us to look at the book of Hebrews as a whole uh, and to, to treat it as a, a, a test case or a demonstration of how we can use the Bible. 
and I'll, I'll be applying that both to the Old Testament and the New Testament because uh, this is a book that makes a great deal of use of the Old Testament scriptures. Now, it's called the book of Hebrews, maybe because uh, this book was written to Christians, believers from a Jewish background. Oh, well, that may explain why he's using a great deal of the Old Testament. But I think there's something more to it than that. Because, because I, in a sense, I could, I could just as easily preach this sermon from uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, because they are also New Testament epistles which make a great deal of the Old Testament and, and indeed contain many quotations of the Old Testament. Now, you can check this up yourself, but most uh, of the quotations when the Apostle Paul is actually quoting, you know what you know I mean by that, you know, he's actually you know, uh, putting down a pen on paper you know, verses from the Old Testament, uh, most of his quotations from the Old Testament are in those four letters. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians. Of course, in all his letters, he's drawing on the Old Testament, but it's very, very obvious in those. So I could have chosen any one of those books. But for various reasons, I want us to look at this letter to the Hebrews tonight as a test case, a demonstration. How should we use the Old Testament but also the New Testament. How can we use the Bible? And, and my emphasis is very deliberately on use. Now, perhaps you don't expect to hear from someone who's Dr. Greg, you know, <laughs> teaches at a college, those kind of things, and anything practical, but I, I'm trying to be very, very practical tonight. And I'm speaking about how we, would, we should use uh, the Bible. Because that really, in many ways, is the vital matter. Don't bother telling me how many Bibles you have at home or, or even how many different versions of the Bible you have sitting on your shelf. What I'm really interested in, what use are you putting that Bible, those Bibles that you have? No use, it's, it's no use them sitting on a shelf or kind of locked away somewhere within your phone or whatever. Uh, we believe the Bible. We believe every word in the Bible. But the acid test really is, well, well, well what use am I putting that word uh, of God that I, see, I say, uh, I believe everything that it says? The practical test of what are you doing with the Bible. Yes, it's important to believe that the Bible is the Word of God because that's what it is. It's God's Word to the human race and it speaks very spe specifically to us, His people, what we're to believe, how we're to live. But are we using the Bible in the way that it was intended to be used? And really, there's nothing I like seeing better than a well-thumbed Bible. In fact, I almost get excited when I see people having a Bible and they've had it for a number of years and it's beginning to fall apart. Or if I just happen to kind of glance at a page or two, there's all this kind of underlining and highlighting in pink or whatever colour you use. And there's kind of writing in the margins and so forth. I love to see a Bible. Uh, in fact, uh, I love to see a Bible which, and I suppose you can't really do this, but you know, it's an overused Bible. A and it's only got a certain number of days left before another copy is going to have to be purchased. The same kind of thing is going to happen again. I'm talking about using the Bible. In fact, I, I encourage people to destroy Bibles by using them which is what we're supposed to be doing, isn't it? So, using the Bible. Now, no doubt next week, when Logan's preaching, everyone's going to have these tattered old Bibles, just, just, to, just to prove to our minister, our pastor, yes, yep, I'm, I'm using the Bible. Well, or maybe we should, we should bring out some of our old Bibles like that. I hope you have gone through. If you've been a, a Christian for a number of years, I hope you've gone through 
several Bibles. I know you're thinking, well, Greg, yours doesn't look all that tatty. In fact, it's got a nice new plastic cover because, yes, I had to put a nice new plastic cover on it only about a week ago because it was uh, beginning to fall asleep and I, I fall, fall, fall to bits. And I've, I've also reinforced the spine, which is beginning to... Uh, and I've actually got three of these Bibles which are totally identical, depending on which city I happen to be at the moment. Uh, I, I not only use the Bible, I, I use the same version of the Bible, even the same edition of the Bible that I've had since a teenager, because I want to use it, I want to know it as well as I possibly can. Not so I'll kind of go around kind of being a talking head and kind of sprouting all this Bible knowledge, but so that God using his spirit, his word will more and more be in my life, in my thinking and in my actions. It's all about using the Bible. Well, why would we want to use the Bible? Even uh, use and abuse, if you know what I mean. Be constantly in the word, reading the word, thinking about the word, seeking to live out God's word. Why, why would we want to do that? What, why is the Bible different from just about any other kind of book, indeed, we've got to say, yeah, different than every other book. Uh, it's not the kind of book, and most books are like this, isn't it? You, you read it once, you quite enjoyed it, but you're not really planning to read it again. Now, probably most, even all of the books that we might use, all the other books, we use them like that, don't we? We read them once. Uh, and maybe we've seen the movie based on the book or something like that. But the, the Bible is not that kind of book. There is no other book like it because it's the word of God. I trust you know that. I trust you believe that. It, it, this is the book that reveals to us the mind of God. That's what the author to Hebrews believes and, and shows in the way in which he has written this letter. Let's look at just a couple of examples here in chapter 1, where he begins to give some quotations from the Old Testament scriptures. Notice what he says, verse 5, For to what angel did God ever say, and now we have our quotation, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. That's a quotation from Psalm 2, verse 7. It's one of very few Psalms in book one of the Psalter. Remember how the book of Psalms is divided into five books. It's, it's, it's one of very few Psalms which doesn't have a title and doesn't tell us who wrote it. Remember, uh, almost the whole of book one is taken up with Psalms of David. Uh, but Psalm 1, Psalm 2, we're not told. We're not told who actually put pen to paper and wrote this Psalm. But uh, the author of uh, Hebrews tells us what we need to know about this. For to what angel did God ever say? So no matter who the original author and, and the inspired composer of Psalm 2 was, the writer of Hebrews says the important thing is that God said these things about his son. This is God's word. This, this sets this book above and apart from any other book that is available to us because God said these things to us, uh, revealing to us his mind, his will, his purposes for us and, and for this world. Here's an authoritative disclosure of the mind of God. And so here's a book to be studied, endlessly studied and read, a book to be used. Another example, uh, just a bit further down in verses 8 and 9, but of the Son, he says, and the he is God. So here's another passage where God is speaking about his Son, and it is uh, two verses here, verses 8 and 9. It's a quotation from Psalm 45, which seems to be a psalm connected to a royal wedding. 
Now we know who wrote these things, the, these words. Let me just uh, remind you of the quotation here. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The righteous scepter is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God thy God has anointed thee with oil of gladness beyond thy comrades. It's a psalm which is pointing forward to Jesus in various ways. I won't go into the detail there, but it's Psalm 45. And we have it a psalm title. And we know it's the sons of Korah are responsible for these things. But notice that our writer doesn't tell us that. You know, the, the, uh, the names of the authors are available. But what does the writer of the Hebrews says, but of the son he says? Because no matter who is composing the different parts of the Bible, the Old Testament, the different prophets, uh, Solomon, uh, if we go into the New Testament, the different evangelists, the four Gospels, uh, Paul's letters, Peter's letters, so forth, the important thing is that, that, that whoever the human mouthpiece might be, God is saying these things. Now, this is awfully obvious, isn't it? But then the application should be awfully obvious too. If, the, if, this is, if these are actually God's words to us, then here is a book to be used and constantly reused. Now, the author says the same thing in a slightly different way in chapter 3, where he's, giving a, 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 he's referring now to uh, Psalm 95. But chapter 3, verse 7, notice what he says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and then he begins to quote Psalm 95, Today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Psalm 95, which is talking about the wilderness generation and how they went so very wrong because they did not believe what God said and it led to disobedience, it led to punishment and death. But the writer says, as the Holy Spirit says. Now the author to the Hebrews is, is not denying that the Bible was written by different human beings. God using different people as his pen to give us his message and his word. He's not, he's not denying that the Bible has human, in human terms has, has a, a multitude of authors from a multitude of times. But uh, he's saying the very important thing is that God was using those different human authors. And so what we have in the Bible are the words of God. Uh, people led by God's Spirit, inspired is the word we use. But whoever did the actual writing, this is what the Holy Spirit says. Now, um, the author of the Hebrews, turning back to chapter 2, he, he reinforces this in, in quite an intriguing way. Have you ever noticed um, in uh, verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6, how, how a, another quotation from the Old Testament is introduced? What, notice what he says. Uh, in my version, it says, it has been testified somewhere. I suppose we could kind of paraphrase this and say, someone has said somewhere. And then he gives us a quotation from Psalm 8. Now, we don't have a lapse of memory here. This is not the writer of the Hebrews having one of those senior moments, which I'm getting a few more of those, where, you know what I mean, where the mind goes blank and you know the face, you know the person, but you just can't give the person's name. That's not what's happening here. Someone has said somewhere, because who doesn't know these famous words are from Psalm 8? Everyone knows that. What is man? that thou art mindful of him, the son of man, that thou carest for him. Thou hast made him a little let lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honour, putting everything in subjection under his feet. This is a very, very famous psalm, Psalm 8. So it's no lapse of memory, but he's, he's making the point. Someone has said somewhere. 
in a real sense, it doesn't, doesn't matter who said it. The important thing is that God was speaking through that person. God said these things. And so in a sense, yes, he is downplaying the human author. He's not denying the human authorship of Scripture. That would be a great mistake. But he's highlighting the fact that what we have in the Bible is the revelation of the mind of God. And if that's what the Bible is, and it is, if it's God's very words to us, then we need to receive the Bible like that. And that means we need to start using it and, and using it a lot and taking every opportunity we have in this kind of corporate set, setting where we're having fellowship around the word and we're helping each other to understand and apply the word and a minister takes a, a leading role in that but the elders are involved or the other teaching opportunities we have within church life <coughs> And yes, also when Logan isn't looking in the privacy of our homes, we've got our noses in this book using the Bible. That's the kind of treatment that the Bible deserves if it really is the word of God. So I'm challenging you, I'm challenging me. How much am I putting the Bible to good use in my life. Well, if we're going to use the Bible, uh, then we need to use the whole of the Bible. All the Bible, equally in all its parts, is the Word of God. And again, the writer of the Hebrews actually demonstrates that here in this first chapter. Let me point out how he does that. Now, what we actually have here is a series of seven quotations and you know seven's one of those numbers in the bible you know can, you know it's not too much and not too little seven right? seven bible quotations here uh, and notice where he draws those quotations from out of the seven five are from the book of psalms uh, including the first half of verse five thou art my son today i've begotten thee that is psalm two he quotes from psalm 45 the wedding psalm that we read some of those words but he also quotes verse 6 from psalm 104 and then down in verses uh, 10 to 12 psalm 102 and finally in verse 13 psalm 110 so five out of the quotations are from the psalms he also quotes 2 samuel chapter 7 verse 14 that great verse uh, that great from that great chapter the, the covenant with david that's the second half of verse 5 i will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son and he also quotes from deuteronomy chapter 32 so five psalms to samuel deuteronomy do you notice what he's doing let me point that out what he is doing is that he's selected quotations from the three main parts of the Old Testament, the way the Jews organize the Old Testament. We, we have the same books in our Old Testament as the, the books that are, we, we could call it the Hebrew Bible, the, 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 the Bible that the Jews have. Our Old Testament is the same as the Bible of the Jews, but some of the books are placed in different positions, different Bible orders. And Jewish people divide the Bible into three parts. The law is the first part, our, our Pentateuch. And the writer of the Hebrews is quoting from Deuteronomy. The second part are the prophets. And that, that section also contains several books that we would kind of think of as histories. And so he quotes from the prophets, the second section of the Hebrew Bible, when he quotes from 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then he quotes from the third section of the Old Testament as the Jews arrange it. Uh, that's the writings. And he quotes from the Psalms. See the point that he's making? He's taking something from the first section, something from the second, quite a lot from the third. But he's, he's deliberately spreading out his Bible quotations to make the point 
that we're to use and to benefit from the whole of the scripture in all its parts. Now, we don't exactly know when the Jews began to divide their, uh, arrange their Old Testament in this particular way. Some people have suggested that there's a reference to this in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. Um, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms may be fulfilled. Some people have suggested, ah, there's the three parts of the Old Testament, the way the Jews divide them, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, which begins to the writings. But uh, probably in this case, what it is actually, Jesus is actually suggesting the law and the prophets, and that and probably means especially, and especially the Psalms. So, so we probably hear, as most of the time in the, in the New Testament, we talk about the law and the prophets. So we're not sure exactly how far back the three-part division of the Old Testament, arranging in that particular way, when it actually began. But it, does, it, it could well be that the writer of the Hebrews is using those three parts. So this might be an early indication that the Jews are using the Bible in those three parts. But notice he's certainly, especially, focusing on the book of Psalms. Certainly the book of Psalms was one of those parts of the Old Testament that Jesus particularly drew on. The law, the prophets, especially the Psalms, that's what we have here. Now, we're allowed to have our favourite parts of the Bible. That's not wrong. As as long as we aren't always in those favourite parts. Of, of, uh, Of course, we love the Gospels. Who doesn't like looking at Jesus? You know, we love every word he said. We love seeing him in action. We really enjoy it when our minister's preaching on one of the four Gospels. Now, we're we're allowed to love all those things. But we've got to learn to love, if it's a process for you, uh, the letters of Paul as well, which are meat. And just a little bit more challenging. Uh, We have that on the authority of the Apostle Peter himself in his second letter. But they are for our benefit too. And yes, we're allowed to love the Psalms, which are inspiring, but no more inspired than any other part of the Bible. Just as inspired. And so we're to, yes, we can have our favourite parts. We can have certain sections of the Bible, which we go back to more often than other parts. But we're not to neglect any part of God's word because it's all the inspired word of God and it's all to be used. And there's something very special in every part of of the Bible and just talking to Logan for a minute and it's his job when he's preaching on whatever text he's preaching on whatever book he might be taking you to really showing you just how special just how useful this part of the Bible is now and my minister back home was very brave earlier this year we're going we're gonna to have a sermon series on Leviticus. Yeah, good on him. He took us to the book of Leviticus and we discovered just how special, just so how helpful, just how useful the book of Leviticus is. And this, of course, is why ministers over time take their congregation to different parts of the Bible. Indeed, I I encourage my students to do that. I'm a great believer that that for some people in the church, at least, maybe even many, if the minister's preaching on a part of God's word, that that kind of gives us the confidence. Oh, you know, know, it's like wearing a parachute, you know. I've got this parachute or I've got this safety harness. What could possibly go wrong? 
Logan's preaching through Leviticus. I'm going to be really brave and I'm going to read the book of Leviticus for myself at home as well. When ministers, when pastors are preaching, taking their people to different parts of God's word and over a period of time, Old Testament, New Testament, the Pentateuch, the prophets, the wisdom books, Paul, oh, the book of Revelation. <laughs> pastors take, if they're, if, they're not, if they're earning their money, if they're, if they're doing their job, they're taking their people to all the different parts of God's word, setting an example giving us permission, giving us a safety belt so that we'll just be a little bit braver than we sometimes and we'll venture into parts of God's word that we don't know all that well or, we, or, we, or we've even caught, our, caught ourselves thinking, not saying out loud we wouldn't do that or we'd, have to, we'd be taken before the elders, but why on earth did God give this in the Bible? Why, why, why is this in the Bible? Well, you, you discover why this is in the Bible, whatever this might be. When, when you begin to look at it and read it and think about it and pray over it, you discover there's something very special and very helpful in every part of God's Word. An example of this, a historical example, was uh, the time of the Reformation, where... where the reformers, the reformed churches that, that are our tradition, they rediscovered the letters of the Apostle Paul. In, in, in many ways, the Reformation was a rediscovery of Pauline theology. Suddenly, the church rediscovered what it should have always known and should never have forgotten, the value of the writings of the Apostle Paul and the doctrine of justification by faith and, and all the riches that are to be found in the writings of Paul. Maybe we're rediscovering other parts of the Bible today. But every part of the Bible is useful and we need it in all its past parts. So... Uh, just in case you haven't realised it, that's part of the thinking that's going on in the head of your pastor as he takes you to different parts of the Bible. He's kind of, um, remember Back to the Future, you know, when, oh, you know, a dare, you know, kind of, oh, can't resist a dare, you know, kind of, uh, that's what your minister's doing. I dare you to read Leviticus for yourself. I dare you to read Romans for yourself. He's challenging you, but he's also assisting you to become familiar so that you are using every part of the Bible and deriving benefit from it. Right, so the Bible is God's word. We're to use it in all its parts. But, but exactly what, what use are we to make of the Bible when we're talking about using the Bible, yeah, reading the Bible, learning, st applying stuff, yeah, but what do we actually mean by that? Well, again, the writer of the Hebrews gives us an example of, of some of the variety of ways in which we can use the Bible. Now, look what he's doing in chapter 1 here with his seven quotations from the Old Testament, all of which are aiming to establish the doctrine of the divinity, the deity of Jesus, that Jesus is the divine son of God. Or even more shorthand, Jesus is God. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. That's why in verses 10... To 12, he's quoting from Psalm 102, Thou, Lord, didst found the earth in the beginning. The heavens are the work of thy hands. Who is this creator? Who is it who made and sustains the universe? His name is Jesus. He's establishing doctrine here. Let's, let's not think for one moment that the God of the Old Testament is, is simply the Father. 
No, the God of the Old Testament is the Trinity, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so verses in the Old Testament here in Psalm 102, which are describing God the Creator, they can be applied directly to Jesus, who is the God of the Old Testament. But what the writer is doing here with these different Bible quotations, he is establishing doctrine. He's listing out a series of verses, all of which show in various ways that Jesus is God the Son. Now, you can do this too, of course. And this is a, a very helpful thing to do uh, with the Bible. What do we believe? Why do we believe it? No Christian doctrine is based on just one Bible verse, but on many. So you can, you can get an exercise book. Top of the first page, Jesus is God. Go start looking for Bible verses, because that, that's, what, that's what the writer of Hebrews is doing. And each page you could have a different doctrine. Providence, predestination... Justification by faith, whatever it is, and start listing Bible verses, Old Testament and New, which establish the doctrine, the truths we believe. If you're not careful, if, you, if it gets out of hand, you'll end up writing a systematic theology, so be careful. But, but that, that's what theologians do. That, that's, that's how they do it. It begins with a list of Bible verses which establish different Christian doctrines. That's the very thing that the writer of the Hebrews is doing that. Collecting proof texts. That's the word we could use. This verse, that verse, proof texts that establish the truths of our faith. Now in verse chapter 2, he does the same thing, but a different kind of way. It's a different doctrine. Now he is wanting to demonstrate from Scripture the humanity of Jesus. That the Son of God became a human being, the incarnation. And notice what he does here. He doesn't collect a whole lot of different Bible verses, but he focuses just on one important passage. Yes, Psalm 8, verse 6 and following. And so he gives us a longer quotation. Notice that, all, taking up all of uh, basically... Uh, 6, 7, and most of, of verse 8, a longer quotation of Psalm 8, which is an Old Testament anticipation of the incarnation, how Jesus, the Son of divine Son of God, became a human being. And then he does what ministers often do in the pulpit. We've got our Bible passage, and then he picks out that phrase and explains it. Notice at the second half of verse 8, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he then kind of, he explains and applies that line from Psalm 8 to Jesus, the incarnation, how he became a human being. He was made a little lower than the angels and he takes that expression from Psalm 8 and begins to apply it. It's what we call exegesis. That's the fancy word for it. It's like what little boys used to do, you know, when they caught a grasshopper. Pull off that leg. I'm going to find out how this grasshopper works. Pulls off that leg, pulls off that leg, ugh, pulls off that leg. Trouble putting it all back together again. But, but that's exegesis. We take a Bible passage and we take out, take out that bit and have a good look at it and take that bit out. And of course, ministers, we're very clever. You see, we managed to put the, Bible, the passage all back together again and you see how the whole thing works. But that's ex, ex, exegesis or exposition. And that's what the writer of the Hebrews is doing here. And that's why ministers, that's why we preach the way we do. But also this is something that you can do at home, at least to some extent. Get one of these great Bible passages and you, with your, with your tweezers, <laughs> pull out that phrase and have a look at it and, and, and this word and have a little look at it exegesis. So, so that's another way to establish doctrine and, and for us to develop some convictions. So we don't just believe this, that and the other thing because our minister told us. We also now believe this thing and the other thing because we've found it for ourselves in the scriptures. 
And so we're not just eating one or two meals a week here on Sunday, but also eating during the week. We're feeding ourselves from the scriptures. So the writer of the Hebrews is saying that's another way to, uh, way to use the Bible. Let me just quickly show you a few more. In chapter 3 and 4, again, he's taking a Bible passage. This time it's Psalm 95, verse 7, as the Holy Spirit says. But now he's not using it to establish doctrine, but he's saying, don't be like that wilderness generation. Learn from their mistake. Don't have the same unbelieving heart. Believe in God and, and follow his way. So he, he's using the example of the wilderness generation as summed up in Psalm 95. Uh, we could put it like this to teach uh, ethics. Here, particularly to warn us. The Bible is full of warnings and promises. Now, we love the promises. Who doesn't want to be soothed and comforted? And often we go to the Bible for that reason, and that is entirely appropriate, isn't it? Who, who hasn't uh, been in difficulty and received real help and encouragement from something, for example, they've read in the book of Psalms? We love the comforting promises of Scripture. But there's also the other parts, aren't there? Like here, where, where it's warning. And that's sometimes what we need. We need a good... Uh, kick in the pants rather than in, we need the warnings as well as the promises of scripture so so using the bible to, to shape how we live to shape our attitudes we're talking about christian ethics and application in chapters five to seven he does something a bit different he he refers to uh this mysterious but important character in the Old Testament called Melchizedek. We only know about Melchizedek from a few verses at the end of Genesis 14 and Psalm 110 verse 4, the order of Melchizedek. But he tells us about this Old Testament character and, and, and perhaps we could put this under the title of typology, but he can, he, he, this teaches us something about Jesus. This anticipates something about Jesus, who he is, and particularly his work as our great high priest. And the Old Testament characters, of course, not only anticipate Jesus, who is the second and greater Moses, and a greater David, and so forth, but these Old Testament characters also uh, can be used to instruct us in other words, to be models and examples of us. Now, of course, all the characters of the Old Testament are flawed characters. But then again, almost all of the characters in the New Testament, apart from Jesus, is a flawed character. So we, we learn from the strengths and we learn from the weaknesses of the different Old Testament characters we, we need models we need heroes of course the great hero is jesus but this is another use uh, in chapters 8 to 10 what he does is he takes uh, the famous passage in jeremiah 31 about the new covenant and notice chapter 8 the second half of chapter 8 is almost uh, entirely taken up with a, a very long quotation from jeremiah 31 in fact this is the longest Old Testament quotation in the New Testament. Now, I know you won't believe me, and you're going to go home and check, but in three weeks' time, when you've gone through the New Testament and you've done all the sums, you'll reluctantly say Greg was right. This is the longest Old Testament quotation in the New Testament, the New Covenant, and then he quotes it more briefly uh, in chapter 10, Verses 16 and 17, because what he's doing in this process, is, in, this, in this passage, is showing that it's through Jesus, through his sacrifice, through his death, that he brings in all the benefits of the new covenant predicted by Jeremiah. But we have begun to receive the benefits of the new covenant through the work of Jesus and his sacrifice upon the cross. Another use. And then most famously, and this is the last example I'll give, chapter 11, we, we 
we're familiar with this wonderful roll call of faith. All the great people of faith, or at least some of them, the great people of faith in the Old Testament scriptures, going back, starting with Abel, particularly highlighting Abraham and Moses, the great heroes of the faith who persevered. See, that's the aspect of faith the writer of Hebrews particularly is, is focusing on here. True faith that kind of keeps on going on. It's a faith that doesn't give up. It's a faith that expresses itself in perseverance. As, as one uh, person has expressed it, this is the only Christian grace that can't be counterfeited. You know, people can, pretend, people can pretend to do lots of stuff, but you can't pretend to persevere. You either persevere or you don't. Uh, yeah, it's the one grace that can't be counterfeited. It, it, it's what really shows that someone has faith. They keep trusting in all circumstances, in the face of every challenge, those who persevered in their faith. Now, one of those heroes is Moses, and I, I've been trying to make him something of a little personal hero of me. I, lo I love that verse about Moses in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now, now Moses is not my hero. Uh, when I say, when Moses is my hero. I'm, when saying that, I'm not implying that I'm like Moses. Sorry, I don't have any delusions of grandeur, right? But I like to be like Moses. Because you remember what it says, Descri how it describes him. In, in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, he is the meekest man in all the earth. Just in case Logan calling me Dr. Greg, it all goes to my head and I start thinking I know everything. The meekest man <laughs> in all the earth. In other words, with all our Bible knowledge, humility. Meekness, not getting above ourselves, realizing we're nothing without God. And anything we've achieved is entirely because of his goodness and grace. The meekest man in all the earth. Well, there's lots of things that we can learn from the Old Testament saints. So the focus, as, as becoming clear, using the Bible. Let me just finish with a, a famous quotation uh, in uh, 2, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. This is, this is what, these are well-known words, aren't they? All scripture is inspired by God and notice there is not a full stop after that. We're very familiar with that part of this verse. All scripture is inspired by God. We say, Amen. Yeah, it, it's the inspired word of God. Everything in the Bible is true. It's all scripture is inspired by God. But notice that the actual focus of the verse, where does it lead to? It leads to the second and longer part of this verse. Notice, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And in a real way, what I'm saying tonight, everything I've said tonight is really an exposition of the second part of this verse because of what the bible is it's the very word of god all scripture is inspired by god because of that because it's god's word in all its parts it's all about using the word of god it's profitable teaching reproof correction and training in righteousness we're, we're not here to become people with this kind of you know great bible knowledge which is just kind of in our heads and not being put to use no we're to use the bible uh, live out those truths that we discover live out that ethic that we discover in the word of god find the models and heroes and particularly jesus that we need to inspire in all that we do so next time I visit, I want to see some tattered Bibles, all right? So if you hear I'm coming, everyone will be bringing out their old tattered Bibles. Just, But uh, let's use the Bible. Let's pray. Yes, God, our Father, like all lessons, like all important lessons, they're dreadfully simple. 
and even obvious, but doesn't mean we're doing it. Father, thank you that you've given us the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Thank you for this inspired book, this book which is like no other. Please, Lord, give us grace to, to live out and to put into practice what we say we believe about the Bible. Father, this is a book to be used, to be enjoyed like no other. This is the one book that we've got to become totally familiar with. And Lord, our desire is that your spirit will use your word in our lives and through us in other people's lives to make us the people that we are meant to be. Lord, please make us individuals, make us a church that is constantly using the Bible. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.